Good morning. Welcome to the second day of Virtual Actor 2021. We had a wonderful uh, first day, beautiful lectures. I would like uh, to introduce uh, Dr. Mukul Kapoor, who will be moderating the first session on CAVG and heart failure. Over to Mukul Kapoor. Uh, good morning, everybody. It's a great pleasure to moderate the session on CAVG and heart failure. We had a wonderful one, day one, and now we start the day two of Actor 2021. The chairpersons for this session are Dr. Anil Karlekar, from, uh, who was at Portis Escorts uh, Hospital at Delhi, Dr. Sachin Soche from Command Hospital Air Force Bangalore, Dr. Rajiv Juneja from Medanta the Medicity, and Dr. Adri Woster from the University of Cape Town, South Africa. The speakers for the session are Dr. Sashikiran, Dr. Sarvana Babu, and Dr. Niren Bhavsar. I request the chairpersons to conduct the session and introduce the speakers. I first call upon Dr. Anil Karlikar to introduce the first speaker. Thank you, Dr. Kapoor, and good morning, everybody. I have the pleasure to invite Professor Shashikiran from Postgraduate Institute of Medical Sciences, Rohtak, to, uh, to talk about update on anesthesia for uh, op-cap surgery. He, she has several publications to her credit and has also worked in UK. May I request Dr. Sachin to introduce the next speaker? Good morning, everybody. Uh, I have the privilege of uh, introducing Dr. Sarvanam Babu. Uh, he's an assistant professor at Sri Chitra Trinal Institute of Medical Sciences at Trivandrum. And uh, he will be speaking on CABG in cardiogenic shock, a decision making and perioperative considerations. Uh, and now I'd request Dr. Juneja to please introduce the third speaker. Morning, everybody. It's my privilege to introduce Dr. Niren Bhavsar from CIMS Hospital, Ahmedabad. Uh, he has a special interest in solid organ transplant and would be speaking on evaluation and management of right heart failure. I'll request Dr. Mukul Kapoor to start. Uh, thank you, Chairpersons, for the kind introdu introduction of the speakers. I would now request the first speaker, Dr. Shashi Karan, uh, Kiran, to start her talk. Uh, good morning. Thank you, Chairpersons, for the kind introduction. And I thank Dr. Rajesh Arya for giving me this opportunity. Today, I'll be speaking about update in anesthesia for OPCAB. So OPCAB is uh, classically performed through sternotomy incision and heart is stabilized by stabilizer. A variety of anosmosis can be performed. Just wanted to highlight that for the proximal anosmosis into the aorta, a brief period of aortic clause pumping may be required. Whereas for the distal anosmosis, occlusion of coronaries is required. OPCAB is advantageous as it is associated with reduction of post-operative complications. There is marked decrease in systemic inflammations and myocardial and cerebral injuries, they are reduced. So minimally invasive surgery is leads to further reduction in complications. Anesthesiologist has very important role to play during OPCAB as hemodynamic stability is to be provided and they can play a great role in preventing and managing myocardial ischemia. One should always have a discussion with the surgeon to form best perioperative strategy that will lead on to optimal patient outcome. Various uh, types of anesthesia available are generally uh, that is traditionally general anesthesia with endotracheal intubation or high thoracic epidural analgesia along with general anesthesia can be provided fast track anesthesia in which the patients they are extubated within six hours of surgery and ultra fast track anesthesia with extubation right in operating room and awake surgery in preoperative anesthetic assessment as usual we are doing um, in addition, one should know both about the severity 
and location of coronary lesions and please discuss the plan with surgeon and also discuss with the patient specific anesthetic techniques and the risk benefit ratio anthropoietin or tinectomic acid can be used as per center preference and if you are contemplating regional techniques one must be aware about the correct asra guidelines and of course we are all using routinely cell saving devices to premedicate apart from anxiolysis atinolol 50 mg at the time of premedication can be given unless the patients are already on beta blockers in monitoring apart from again routine monitoring i would like the uh, like to highlight about the importance of trans esophageal echocardiography all the patients who are under general anesthesia should have depth of anesthesia monitored along with neuromuscular monitoring as we plan fast track or uh, you know right ultra fast track uh, recovery cerebral oximeter is very useful then cvc or pse can be inserted according to the patient needs and coagulation profile monitoring Uh, however ecg uh, may be limited during heart manipulations and it may produce artifacts and uh, then again i would like to highlight the importance of jugular bulb oxygen saturation it is predictor predictor of possible post operative cognitive dysfunctions however it is routine if used in routine it is quite invasive and expensive so what do we do so if a cvp is more of 8 mm of mercury and oxygen mixed venous oxygen less than 70% and psc2 of 40 mm of mercury is there then one should uh, think that it can be associated with jugular bulb desaturation and so post operative cog cognitive dysfunction of the patients may be impaired the role of tee cannot be underestimated it may facilitate the detection of worsening cardiac function and any new segmental wall motion abnormalities are the most sensitive indicators of intraoperative mi however tee image quality may be impaired in certain situations uh, for fluid management cvp and pap may be, become unreliable so stroke volume pulse pressure variation or tee guided fluid management should be carried out coagulation monitoring is very important so mostly act is being used some surgeons they like to like us to give 100 units per kg some may like full aperization however anyway an act value of about 300 is acceptable and the point to be noted is that during awake op cab there is significantly less pro coagulant activity as compared to the patients who are under general anesthesia various anesthetic approaches so general anesthesia with opioids and inhalation anesthesia or tiva can be used ga can be combined with neuromuscular blockade control ventilation in addition to thoracic epidural analgesia and then awake in which regional anesthesia with spontaneous ventilation using thoracic epidural alone for general anesthesia propofol or etamidate can be used i am using etamidate regularly and i found uh, for induction of anesthesia this regime quite useful that fentanyl ketamine 0.5 mg per kg and propofol titrated dosage rocronium is the muscle relaxant of choice and volatile anesthetics uh, we know that they provide pharmacological ischemic preconditioning if mid cap is planned then double lumen endotracheal tube may be required one must avoid the use of high dosage of long acting opioid for obvious reasons although remifentanil is excellent drug but if not available then fentanyl and sufentanil can be used 
dexmedomidine during opcap is a good adjunct um, now fast track anesthesia as we discussed earlier the patients they can be extubated within 6 hours post operatively and it has been seen that it decreases the less of um, length of icu stay what about high thoracic epidural analgesia combined with general anesthesia so all the advantages of thoracic epidural they are utilized it provides better analgesia lung conditions are better post operatively the morbidity and mortality they are decreased and it also facilitates early extubation then it increases coronary and memory artery perfusion myocardial oxygen demand is decreased and renal functions are improved however one must carefully time the thoracic epidural and one must be aware with the esra guidelines so as to manage you know anticoagulation in case there is traumatic tear please delay surgery for 24 hours so awake op cap it's the promising modality of mid cap in which combined femoral nerve block and thoracic epidural analgesia are utilized or thoracic epidural anesthesia alone can be used local infiltration can be used for vessel graft harvesting however one must be aware that opening of pleura may be a major concern and nevertheless psychological impact of awake cardiac surgery should also be considered temperature management can be challenging during op cap as heat dispersion is high uh, for perioperative analgesia during uh, op cap at the same time we have to provide high quality analgesia and opioids should be avoided in high dose so what to do i find this regime uh, quite useful that gabapentin 600 mg as pre medication can be given and pestamol 1 g iv ketamine 0.5 mg per kg and titrated doses of fentanyl can be used uh, for chest pains bilateral sap blocks can be quite useful hemodynamic changes they are you know commonly occurring during op cap if there is rise in pap pcwp and cvp any appearance of large wave they may indicate acute ischemia or mr how to manage hypotension head down tilt vasopressors fluid management and how surgeons can help pleuropericardial incision can be made so that will decrease the load on rv routine elevation of right limb of sternal border should be used and right sided pericardial sutures can be loosened then heart repositioning can be done arrhythmias should be managed severe resistant hypotension may require the use of intraaortic balloon pump how to manage ischemia so for that one should Uh, the anesthetic should have good collaboration with surgeon hemodynamic stability should be maintained and maintain adequate mean arterial pressure heart rate peri operative uh, prophylactic anti arrhythmic agents can be considered and uh, maybe that if you use prophylactic beta blockers they may reduce uh, post operative atrial fibrillation so regarding reperfusion if uh, there is post op cardiac complications persistent and new regional wall motion abnormalities they may worsen the post op cardiac complications so electrolyte should be managed quite meticulously especially potassium and magnesium majority of the patients they can be extubated early and uh, however if we are planning ultra fast track anesthesia then it requires a stable warm normal volumic pain free and adult patient at the end of surgery to summarize op cap surgery 
poses special challenges and difficulties for the anesthesiologist. It's a teamwork and anesthesiology, uh, anesthesiologist plays a very important perioperative role and fast track and ultra fast pathways are recommended these days. Thank you so much for patient hearing. A very good morning to the chairpersons and the delegates of ACTACON 2021. First of all, I appreciate the efforts of the organizing team in bringing out this conference on a virtual move. Coming to the talk, CABG in cardiogenic shock. This is a clinical situation where the decision making is always a dicey for the multidisciplinary cardiac team, as well as it is a unique challenge for the perioperative anesthesiologist. Acute myocardial infarction with cardiogenic shock. Why it is troublesome? Because it has a higher risk of mortality and morbidity. There is always a time limitation decision making. The decisions that has been made is with an incomplete information and associated comorbid conditions always prevail in these subset of patients. And there is a broad spectrum of presentation ranging from mild anotropic support to maximal mechanical circulatory support. And there is always associated mechanical complications like ventricular septal rupture and myocardial ischemic mitral regurgitation in these patients. Sometimes the patients may present with active CPR, which may further increase the mortality and morbidity, and the available risk prediction tools fails to predict the expected, observed, expected mortalities in these patients. Now, brushing up the basics of cardiogenic shock, when the myocardial infarction happens, both the systolic and diastolic dysfunction starts, and the patient having going in for low cardiac output, hypotension, reduced coronary perfusion pressures, resulting in ischemia, and also there will be an elevation of left ventricular and diastolic pressures resulting in pulmonary congestion, resulting in hypoxemia, further aggravating the ischemia. Also, side by the inflammatory medias also get released and it will further acting at various levels, resulting ultimately in the progressive deterioration of the cardiac function. Unless the intervention has been taken at a early as possible, the survival of these patients is doubtful. Acute myocardial infarction in cardiogenic shock. The care of these patients depends on whether the recovery of organ function is given importance first, then patient has to be stabilized with medical therapy and the revascularization is delayed. If you want to preserve the maximum myocardial viability, then you have to do a yearly revascularization strategy. So coming to the data, so uh, by RA et al, from nine, collected on 22,000 patients from 1994 to 2008 of all the CABG patients, 0.4% of patients required emergency CABG, among which 30% of the emergency CABG patients were in cardiogenic shock. And another data published by Meta et al on uh, 5,496 patients of uh, CABG from the STS database has shown that 1.5% of all CABG patients were in cardiogenic shock. What are the predictors? of CABG in cardiogenic shock, where the three vessel disease, left main disease, failed PCA, and higher STS and logistic euro scores. The in-hospital mortality analysis has shown that the mortality varies from 39.6% in 2000 to 18.7% in 2016. So the mortality in CABG, when there is associated valve intervention is there was 33%, and the mortality when CABG is associated with ventricular septal rupture repair was 58%. The one year survival rates available data shows that it has a 59% in 2003 and 46.8% in 2005, and it is 100% in 2007. But the study was a, uh, uh, was a observational study with a limited sample size of 15 patients. Now coming to the five year survival of these patients, the data shows that it was 40.9% and 10 years survival rate is 47%. So morbidity of CABG in cardiogenic shock as variable, most common is a acute kidney injury of 50% and stroke amounting to 4.3% and re-exploration was 50% and prolonged ventilation was 47.5%. CABG versus PCA. So far, there is no randomized control trials available to compare head to head on which is better, PCA or CABG. But few observational studies have shown that uh, uh, the 30-day and one-year mortality uh, analyzed from the data of a shock trial patients uh, shown that there is no uh, significant difference between the 30-day and one-year mortality 
whereas the in hospital mortality was significantly less in the cabg patients also the 96 hour 30 day and one year survival rate was also there was no significant difference between the pci group as well as the cabg group why cabg is preferred to pci is due to the higher rate of complete revascularization there is uniform use of transesophageal echocardiography during the preoperative period to diagnose the hemodynamic status as well as the complications of mi and rapid myocardial protections on cpb to unload the ventricle and uniform setting of post operative cardiac surgical icu coming to the risk prediction the available risk prediction tools like euroscore and sts score fails to predict the accurate risk so the observed mortality in these patients was found to be higher when compared to the predicted mortality in these subgroups so the salvage patients for cabg patients are always have a higher mortality when compared to the uh, other a uh, subgroup of patients and the redo surgeries also very high and respiratory failure is 59% and patient going in for renal failure is also high in these patients coming to the patients who are on mechanical circulatory support before taking for cabgs the iabp is the is the uh, iabp is the most commonly used mechanical circulatory support in patients with cardiogenic shock the requirement of preoperative circulatory support was 3.3% and intraop and postop support needed was 5.1% the preop circulatory support modality is the mechanical circulatory support modality is the infella most commonly preferred and postop is the ecmo coming to the motor analysis of mortality of patients patients without mechanical circulatory support as a mortality of 16% and with preop implementation of mechanical circulatory support as 13.37.2% and intraop and postop had a higher mortality coming to the ecmo yearly ecmo implementation has shown to have a better survival when compared to the patients where the ecmo was implemented during the intraoperative and postoperative period also <clears throat> the strategy of implementing impella during the preoperative period and ecmo during the postoperative period has a lower mortality and better weaning when compared to the patients where ecmo is used in the postoperative period alone coming to the guidelines of north american society it has shown that emergency cabg is recommended in patients with cardiogenic shock with a class 1 recommendation and also it has to be a, uh, recommended <coughs> emergency cabg is recommended in patients with myocardial infarction associated with septal rupture and uh, mitral insufficiency also cabg is recommended in salvage patients who have undergoing active cpr and uh, an emergency cabg is also recommended in patients with failed pci coming to the european guidelines european guidelines also recommends emergency cabg in patients with cardiogenic shock but there is no recommendations on failed pca and salvage cb uh, salvage patients salvage uh, patients perioperative anesthetic goal <coughs> in these patients is treat the global tissue hypoperfusion preserve the myocardial perfusion and unload the ventricle so the management target strategy, strategy given by aha was optimize the determinants of coronary arterial perfusion like heart rate diastolic and mean arterial pressures and right ventricular and diastolic pressures to reduce the risk of perioperative myocardial ischemia and infarction the management strategies to <coughs> optimize the intravascular volume control the heart rate and rhythm maximize the oxygenation and optimize the ventilation hemoglobin correct the electrolyte and metabolic imbalances increase or decrease the inotropic support depending upon the clinical situation Uh, give vasodilation so that uh, the svr will be reduced and it will reduce the uh, afterload to the ventricle and preserve and implement the iabp and mechanical circulatory support whenever is there is a need and aggressive use of diuretics to unload the ventricles and the lungs preoperative assessment the npo status should be ensured as because these patients will come in an emergency npo status may not be adequate to prepare accordingly note down the current vasopressors inotropic dose and uh, prepare if any additional supports are needed and assessment of volume status has to be done review of imaging has to be done and availability of blood and blood product should be ensured and avoid unwanted studies because it will further delay the revascularization so intraoperative consideration induction is a most dangerous time period so no single anesthetic agent is superior uh, go for invasive hemodynamic monitoring always and uh, mechanical ventilation with peep will always reduce the preload and afterload of the ventricles 
availability of surgeon should always be ensured because anytime patient may crash during induction and uh, so immediate sternotomy and uh, <clears throat> uh, institution of cardiac pulmonary bypass is needed yearly consideration of mechanical circulatory support is always warranted in these patients coming to the invasive lines and monitoring always prefer central venous uh, central arterial access so that you will also help in uh, iabp implantations if there is a need and central venous access should always preferred for supports focus on cardiac output and filling pressures and pulmonary artery catheter usage depends upon the institutional performance preference so the data shows that uh, pulmonary capillary vasopressure is the most reliable monitor which predicts the cardiac mortality as well as uh, post operative survival coming to the post operative considerations ischemic myocardium takes time to recover its inotropy so the goal should be in the post operative period should be to reduce the myocardial and systemic oxygen demand increase and maximize the oxygen delivery so the target should be avoid tachycardia avoid the lv distensions by unloading the ventricle maintain coronary perfusion pressures and maintain normothermia give adequate pain control maintain adequate hemoglobin level and adequate arterial oxygen content so coming to the te during cabg asa has given uh, recommendations to do te during cabgs so what are the <coughs> things we can gain from te during cabg is the pre operative and post operative assessment of the global and regional systolic function diastolic function should be assessed so that <coughs> valvular aortic valvular aortic assessment and assessment for complications of acute myocardial infarction like ischemic mr and any vsds and assess the volume status and it may assist in in implementing the mechanical circulatory support cabg in cardiogenic shock has a considerable mortality and significant morb morbidity decision making depends upon the yearly invasive monitoring and the echo reports and the coronary angiography cardiogenic shock specific risk prediction and strategic risk stratification is always needed and yearly and aggressive institution of mechanical circulatory support should be warranted so cabgs in cardiogenic shock should be preferred <coughs> in left main disease triple vessel lesions lesions not amenable to pci and patients with diabetes and mechanical complications of acute myocardial infarction still certain questions are unanswered in this clinical situation of cabg so the ideal revascularization uh, revascularization strategies is not uh, Are given by the literature whether to do a PCI or CABG. The role of advanced circulatory support is is not uh, uh, doubt is is doubtful, and the ideal risk prediction tool is not available. And the physiological support in the yearly postoperative period there is no much data on this, and the role of yearly dialysis in this group is not known. Thank you. good morning i don't have any conflict of interest for this presentation right heart failure is a significant challenge in cardiology cardiac surgery and intensive care with the high prevalence of morbidity and mortality for those who deal in congenital heart disease rvf is common and brings different set of problems the interest in rv brought in life of a cardiac anesthetist is because uh, uh, more and more complex cases we are doing and uh, developing fields of heart lung transplant and elevated there are diverse causes of right heart failure including among other the primary cardiomyopathies of the rv rv ischemia and infarction volume loading by cardiac lesions of uh, congenital heart disease and valvular lesions pressure loading by uh, pulmonary stenosis or pulmonary hypertension from variety of causes progressive rv dysfunction in these conditions leads to increased morbidity and mortality right heart failure can be acute or chronic and we pose both kind of them RV function depends on numerous factors, but it is primarily more sensitive to outflow, which we usually measure in terms of pulmonary artery systolic pressure and PVR. Both of these parameters do not represent particular component of back pressure changes of LV. RV consumes one sixth energy of uh, LV and is coupled to high compliance and uh, low resistance pulmonary circulation and subject to adaptive changes in the volume rather than the pressures. If you look at the RV PV loops, it lacks uh, isovolumic contraction and relaxation phases, unlike LV. But in compensated overload, these phases appears, and end-systolic pulmonary vascular resistance is shifted towards left. In decompensation, end-systolic uh, PVR shifts right, and cardiac output falls. Secondly, afterload is a primary determinant of RV function, and minor increase in afterload causes large fall in stroke volume. 
in settings of LV dysfunction, a compliance uh, PA compliance increase more with the reduction in pulmonary capillary wage pressure rather than falling PVR alone. So elevated LV filling pressure directly increases the RV afterload and later causes vasoconstriction and vascular remodeling, leading to high PVR. Ventricular interdependence means when RV, RV dilates and fails, mechanical flattening and left foot shift of IVS occurs, increasing LV EDP and infants LV diastole filling and leads to low cardiac output. Means during diastole, both the ventricle compete for filling within a confined pericardial space. While during systole, 20 to 40 percent of the RV systolic pressure results from the contraction of IVS. Low cardiac output uh, happens in RV failure because of various reasons, and I'm not going in detail. Evaluation of the right heart failure includes, of course, clinical and hemodynamic component, as well as imaging modalities, of which we are mainly interested in echocardiography because uh, uh, we are perioperative physicians. Clinically, acute right heart failure presents with the signs of hypoperfusion, shortness of breath because of tissue hypoxia and shock, arrhythmias, right upper quadrant pain, sometimes cyanosis if there is right to left shunt. There will be raised JP with prominent V wave of TR. No, on auscultation, you may find third heart sound, hollow systolic murmur of TR, primary lung pathology underlying that. If associated with LVF, there are crepitations of pulmonary edema. There may be hepatomegaly, ascites, and edema, all suggest acute on chronic right heart failure. Chronic right heart failure patient complains of decreased functional capacity and peripheral edema, while uh, they will have uh, cardiorenal or cardiohepatic abnormalities as well. Protein malnutrition, coagulopathy, and cachexia. On examination, we'll find raised JVP, edema, ascites, hepatomegaly, pleural pericardial effusion, prominent S2, S3 gallop, PR murmur, right parasternal heave, and or irregular pulse because of arrhythmias. ECG classically will show right axis deviation with prominent R wave in lead B1, tall P wave in inferior leads, and presence of arrhythmias. In case of acute P, there is S deflection in uh, lead 1, initial Q deflection in 3, and T inversion in lead 3. There are no RV specific biomarkers, but anti pro BNP and troponin uh, can guide us a little bit. Echocardiography the importance of RV is more as a prognostic predictor in a range of clinical conditions. And one of the largest changes has been from mere visualization of RV on echo to routine quantitative assessment of RV structure and function. Current best practice guidelines recommendation is to use at least two quantitative parameters during routine echo examination. These are few common views. Quantitative parameters are standardized more or less. RV dimensions can be measured in different views, but proper alignment is important. RV basal dimension taken in four chamber uh, with RV focus view, while RV OT proximal dimensions are measured in parasonal short axis views anterior to the aortic wall. RV wall thickness measured at end diastole in the plaques and the subcostal views. Here it is very important to look for the IVS. Abnormal septal motion with the end diastole flattening indicate volume overload and uh, end systolic flattening may indicate pressure overload. This is uh, led to a change in the LV shape in the short axis to a D-shaped ventricle with abnormal eccentricity index. This has prognostic implication. Reduce FSE has been shown to be an independent predictor of heart failure, sudden cardiac death, stroke, and mortality in patient with pulmonary embolization. More accurate than TAPSA, only limitation is there uh, should be good endocardial definition, which is difficult at times. 2D EF and volumes are very inaccurate and are of no use, while 3D volume and EF correlates well with the MRI. Latex machines have automatic tracing of RV endocardium and auto calculates volume, ejection fraction, and RV strain. So validation is only for the RV free wall longitudinal strain because other walls are influenced by many factors. 3D RV strain lower than minus 17% is considered abnormal. RV free wall strain by speckle tracking less than 20% is minus 20 percent is abnormal rv myocardial performance index or tie index mostly obtained by pulse wave or doppler or tissue doppler imaging at the lateral faculty analysis it reflects both systolic and diastolic function of the rv mpa of rv has been found to be a prognostic marker in patient with pulmonary hypertension both as a single measurement as well as serial evaluation rv mpi less than 0.55 via tdi and less than 0.4 why pulse flow doppler is considered abnormal. For pulse flow doppler, you need two separate views, RV OT and inflow views to measure the ejection time and the tachyphid work closure time respectively. 
uh, and uh, you need a regular rr because of it is measured in two different cardiac cycles the apse measures the longitudinal shortening of the rv from end diastole to the peak systole simple and reproducible assuming that the rv free wall is indicative of the function of rv as a whole and rv contractions are predominantly longitudinal in healthy individual but in this state when rv dilates actually radial component becomes important tapsy can be falsely negative if significant rv dysfunction and lv apex has significant rotational component right ventricular systolic excursion velocity rps this is measured at the uh, same lateral tachycardia frenulus by tissue doctor imaging it is more or like similar to tapsy and if it is less than uh, 10 cm per second it is uh, considered significant diastolic function is as same as lv diastolic function there are various pressure estimates uh, pulmonary atrial systolic pressure is, is estimated by tr peak velocity plus ra pressure pulmonary atrial diastolic pressure by pr and diastolic velocity plus ra pressure mean pulmonary atrial usually by uh, pr peak velocity plus ra pressure there are other ways to measure the mean pulmonary atrial pressure also pulmonary hypertension is when the mean pulmonary atrial pressure is more than 25 mm of mercury there is one of the criteria tapsy to uh, pulmonary atrial systolic pressure ratio is a potential marker of rvpa coupling lower the ratio poorer is the diagnosis ivc diameter and collapsibility index estimates the ra pressure so the preload there are some objective evidences like hepatic flow reversal suggestive of severe tr is left going or diastolic uh, ivs fluttering uh, suggest volume overload ivs systolic fluttering uh, suggest pressure overload hemodynamic assessment uh, parameters associated with the rv function and the thresholds which are associated with the clinical events are ra pressure or cvp more than 15 mm of mercury suggest your volume overload cvp to the pulmonary capillary wedge pressure ratio uh, shows rv to i mean right to left discordance of filling pressure and is indicative of right heart failure after elved and acute uh, mi Pulmonary atrial pulsatility index is uh, PA pulse pressure to RA pressure ratio. If it is less than 1.85, predicts uh, right heart failure after Albert, and if it is less than one, the risk of right heart failure after acute MI. RV stroke walk index is another very reliable predictor of right heart failure after Albert. If it is less than 0.25 uh, to 0.3 millimeter of mercury into liter per meter square. PVR more than 3.5 would unit is predictive of right heart failure and contraindication for heart transplant. PA compliance less than 2.5 ml per uh, millimeter of mercury means right heart failure in chronic uh, left heart failure and PAH. Right heart evaluation can be done continuously using a CCO PA catheter or single study in cath lab. At our center for most of our pre heart transplant evaluation or elevated evaluation, we prefer to perform using a CCO catheter in the ICU itself. not only that these parameters have predictive values but the dynamic changes help in the early diagnosis of failing rv and management of rv dysfunction in acute care settings be it in cardiology cardiac surgery or cardiac icus continuous monitoring with either hemodynamic parameters or echocardiography gives us clarity about involvement of rv alone or both lv or and rv or rv because of lv all of which help us in uh, better management coming to the medical management of acute right heart failure first thing like in managing any medical condition is to treat the underlying cause but in attempt to improve the rv function and cardiac output we must optimize the preload with volume management diuretics and if needed renal replacement therapy reduce the afterload to improve forward flow and improve the contractility in case of myocardium is the culprit one of the most important thing here is also to maintain the perfusion pressure by maintaining lv output while taking measures to improve the rv function coming to preload optimization primary goal should be reduction in the la pressure to reduce the congestion and pulse rate afterload of the rv excess rv preload can lead to increased dilatation and septal bulge which lead to uh, reduce lv filling so reduce cardiac out uh, stroke volume cardiac output and blood pressure so decongestion actually benefit from restoring favorable ventricular interdependence thus augmenting stroke volume cardiac output and blood pressure initial and periodic assessment must be made cvp is targeted less than 8 to 12 mm of mercury and if it if it is more it must be decongested 
teaching the uh, the traditional teaching that the right heart failure is a preload dependent condition is too simplistic an algorithm is adapted from the caras hf trial to target urea output 3 to 5 liters per day which leads to almost 1.5 liter of negative balance high dose of live loop diuretics are drug of choice to which thiazides can can be added to augment the natriuresis aldosterone antagonist for the maintenance of potassium homeostasis and acetazolamide to counter the hyperchloremic metabolic acidosis can be added if nothing works a low threshold for the renal replacement therapy has to be there after load reduction after correcting reversible causes of elevated pvr like hypoxia acidosis for further reduction we can use either non selective vasodilators like nitrates but they all are, are potential systemic vasodilators and cause hypotension selective pulmonary vasodilators like uh, inhaled nitric oxide or iv sildenafil infusion can be used i know as advantage of reducing pvr without causing hypoxia as it acts only on in ventilated area so there is no shunting and there is no hypoxia not sure about the availability of inhaled prostacyclines here we can use oral drugs like phosphodiesterase five inhibitors or endothelin receptor blockers in case to achieve sustained reduction but having longer half lives some of these agents like bosentan and sildenafil directly increase the rv contractility anodilators are the best drugs to increase uh, the or augment the contractility uh, most commonly uh, milrinone and dobutamine is used milrinone has advantage over dobutamine theoretically but studies do not prove any one drug better over other or we can use both in combination milrinone reduce both rv and lv and as with pressure as it is more potent vasodilator it is less arrhythmogenic produces less tachycardia and effective even with beta blockers dobutamine has advantage of shorter half life and rapid onset causes less hypotension and so less afterload reduction levosimendan can also be used but i could not find convincing literature maintaining perfusion is very important if there is persistent hypotension drug of choice are vasopressors and anotropic action combined like uh, noradrenaline adrenaline and dopamine if there is significant vasodilatation only because of uh, so many uh, anodilator and pulmonary vas uh, vasodilator we are using so then pure vasopressor like vasopressin is required vasopressin has little impact on pvr so there is advantage and has advantage of improving glomerular filtration rate by efferent arterial vasoconstriction thus augmenting the diuresis it also improves myocardial perfusion by increasing diastolic pressure and its addition limits the arrhythmogenic properties of catecholamines not going much in the details of managing chronic right heart failure but fundamental principles remain same improving contractility preload optimization after reduction and anti failure therapy mechanical circulatory support or mcs helps with various configuration and devices for various indications but they come with significant cost and a range of complications along with them we can select mcs therapy based on the uh, required duration of therapy uh, type of rv bypass we need or based on underlying pathology like uh, whether there is isolated right heart failure or secondary to pulmonary disease or secondary to left heart failure based on that we can select the mcs device uh, surgical treatment options are there to correct the valvular lesions if required and as indicated a bailout uh, balloon atrial septostomy can be done in uh, some uh, uh, non responding cases and ultimately heart or heart lung transplant is the solution thank you very much for your attention now i am sharing my screen thank you thank you again one and start uh, thank you very much speakers for the very informative talks and the presentations which were excellent I would now request Dr. Adri Woster to give her synopsis and comments on the three presentations. Good morning from Cape Town. Um, it's almost sunrise here. I would like to thank Ayatta for the opportunity to be part of this excellent virtual conference. Um, I would also like to thank our three speakers for starting the day with three very interesting topics. Our first speaker, Dr. Shashi Kiran, discussed off-pump off coronary artery bypass graft. and highlighted the importance of teamwork and also surgical and anesthetic experience in improving outcomes in this group of patients as recent 5 year morbidity and mortality rates and data for minimally invasive and endoscopic hybrid coronary revascularization 
is also very promising. I think this may become a more utilized um, uh, option for off-pump coronary artery bypass graft in selected patients um, in future. Our second speaker, Dr. Saravana Babu, discussed the very challenging scenario of coronary, coronary artery bypass graft in patients presenting in cardiogenic shock. Um, given the very high mortality rates in these patients, especially from renal failure related to very prolonged low perfusion states, I'm very interested to observe the impact of more widespread use of pre-hospital ECMO um, in this specific group of patients in the years to come as data on that is still quite scanty. Um, finally, Dr. Naren Bafsa gave us a very detailed and extensive overview um, on the assessment and the management of right heart failure. And I'm looking forward to the discussion around this topic. I would like to request that Dr. Mukul Kapoor open the floor now for questions and discussion. Uh, thank you, Dr. Adri. And thank you for the wonderful synopsis. And it's very nice that you joined us today. And it's a pleasure to have you there. Thank you very much. Hi. And now let's start. Let's, let's start taking questions. And the uh, the first set of questions will be directed towards uh, Dr. Shashikiran and the moderator, Dr. Anil Karlekar. The first question is from Dr. Mutuk, uh, Mutukumar Rajagopalan. And his question is, uh, how do you detect perioperative myocardial infarction? And are there any specific mo monitors which help you detect it? Uh, yes, the most reliable monitor is a transesophageal echography and real-time three-dimensional echocardiography is the most sensitive uh, indicator to detect perioperative MI uh, during op-cab. And uh, another can be any appearance of large enlarging Q waves, they may also indicate, but I would rely on TEE. Any comments, Dr. Karlika, on this? Well, undoubtedly, TE is a great help. And uh, there's no question about it that uh, it is the most sensitive and you have the physiologic as well as anatomic uh, uh, evidence of what's happening. In addition, my personal experience has been though uh, pulmonary artery catheters have run out of favor, but uh, my personal feeling and experience has been that it is one of the most sensitive uh, indices of impending trouble, particularly the ischemia. And in op cabs, when things happen so very rapidly, uh, a PA catheter can really forewarn us. T takes little time because of the different positions and, and, and geometry that may change because of the positioning. PA, as long as the trace is good, is a sensitive index. index. Of course, it's a matter of individual yeah. and personal choices. Uh, if you have T, well and good. Otherwise, PA can also forewarn you. That's true. Thank you, sir. Uh, so the ne next question to Dr. Shashi is directed uh, by Dr. Sandeep Mutha. And Dr. Sandeep Mutha uh, wants to know which kind of blocks are better to use in uh, CABG and OPCAP, sorry. Yeah, so OPCAP, as I discussed that, uh, uh, the blocks are that if you are doing awake uh, cab, awake off cap, then the uh, matter of blocks comes. Apart from thoracic capital, I'm not talking. I'm talking only about the regional blocks. So that means that uh, for the harvesting of uh, saphenous vein, as I discussed, femoral nerve block or three nerve block can be used. And uh, for chest drains, bilateral sedatus anterior blocks, they can be very useful. Okay, great. And uh, then uh, there's a question from Dr. Hemant Weicker. And he, he wants to know why put uh, the epidural catheter before preoperatively on a day before surgery. And in case you have a, uh, a tap, which is bloody, and then you need to postpone the surgery. So, and he says, what is the, op the opinion of a surgeon along with that also? He would like to know that. Yeah. Uh, see, whenever I am doing regional techniques uh, like uh, thoracic epidural, so I always discuss a day before with the surgeon that this is the plan and a week because it needs the preparation. And it's a good idea to put epidural catheter a night before surgery. So that if cancellation happens, the list doesn't suffer. Okay. And then uh, another, uh, another question from Dr. Sandeep Mutha. He wants to know what is the incidence of epidural bleed after epidural for cardiac surgery? Uh, see, there is data about epidural hematoma following cardiac surgery. So roughly one in 3,500 is the incidence. 35, that's a, that's a very high, high yeah. list. I yes. would do it if it was so high. I, I would. 
<laughs> you know, it's a uh, data from uh, 2015 study by uh, he had studied the incidence. And so uh, uh, let me tell. I think I was the first person who published data on um, not data actually published oh, yeah. this report on yeah. epidural uh, hematoma after cardiac surgery. And uh, I, I feel I've been uh, though this data probably is uh, a little dry, wrong. The incidence is not so high. I mean, I, I don't know how this data has come, but the incidence is very, very low and it's quite safe to use epidural. Uh, so this data is from uh, uh, G. Landoni, published in literature. <laughs> so I'll take it with a pinch of salt. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, and now, now what, what is uh, another question directed to you is, uh, which uh, this is from Dr. Indra Malik. She wants to know, uh, what is the uh, what are the cases which are best suitable for awake CAPG? For awake CAPG, we have to really uh, select the patients who are having good LV functions and uh, those who uh, in which less hypertension is expected during off care. Yeah, the, the, the person who's more ex, most experienced in awake CAPG is Dr. Mulli Chakravarti. Unfortunately, he's not on the panel. I, otherwise, I would have taken his opinion also on the same. Okay, thank you very much, Dr. Shashi and Dr. Karlekar. I will now direct my questions to uh, Dr. S uh, Saruna Babu and his uh, chairperson, Dr. Sachin Soche. Uh, so th this question has come from uh, Dr. Zivoko Joshi. And Dr. Zivoko uh, Joshi wants to know, which is the induction agent of choice in cardiogenic shock? Yeah, uh, uh, basically it depends upon the clinical condition of the patient and also the clinician, what he prefers to use. So to me, like uh, I prefer to use uh, etomidate as an ideal induction agent of choice with these cardiogenic shock patients with some uh, boluses of fentanyl, depending upon the uh, invasive hemodynamic monitoring uh, status. So I prefer to use uh, etomidate. Uh, so can I ask you one more thing? Uh, what what yeah. dosages and what would you like to restrict your dosages or what kind of dosages would you use? Yeah, I used to use a little bit of restricted dose depending upon the hemodynamic status of the patient. I prefer to use some 0.1 to 0.2 mg per kg of etomidate. So always I prefer to uh, have a, a invasive arterial line before inducing the subset of patients. Okay, uh, but, but do you feel that uh, you can have a slower induction in such cases? Like you, you know, you induce mitral stenosis patients or severe mitral stenosis and you give slow dosages and... Uh, gradually very slow induction kind of thing do you what yeah, yeah definitely 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 it needs a very slow and uh, uh, very slow and steady induction based on the hemodynamic status of the patient thank you and so the next question uh, directed to you again is from dr anil sant and dr anil sant wants to know whether early vascularization revascularization cardiogenic shock, uh, shock uh, he feels that it's very debatable and uh, he wants to know whether there are any outcome uh, data on this? Yeah, definitely. There are no much data has, uh, has been published on this uh, question. But uh, I feel like the shock trial, which has been published in 1999, it was uh, uh, so far uh, uh, <coughs> the only trial which has been done uh, comparing the yearly revascularization versus delayed revascularization. The outcome of these data has shown that uh, uh, the six month mortality and 30 day mortalities are better with yearly revascularization when compared to delayed revascularization by optimizing the patient with uh, mechanical circulatory support or medical therapy. So this is the so far uh, only data available uh, in the literature. Uh, but data still has to come. But uh, so far there is no data on uh, whether PCI or CABG is best. So there is no data available in the literature so far. Uh, can I direct yes, also to Dr. Sachin? Sachin, uh, what is your opinion on this? What, what, how comfortable will you be in uh, revascularization in cardiogenic shock? Yeah, this is a very uh, interesting question. The thing is that uh, these type of patients, they, when they land up, it usually becomes a volleyball match between the cardiologist and the cardiac surgeon. So uh, the for, uh, because these patients are very sick, usually on anotropes and pro probably also on a IBP. And uh, it's always a very uh, difficult situation to go in. And uh, I feel that uh, the uh, uh, full revascularization by a uh, CABG is the the best choice in these type of patients because they have the they have a better uh, outcome and uh, early early uh, intervention is always better than waiting uh, in these patients so they get the best chance if we go in early that's my take uh, thank you sachin thank you very much uh, the next quest, uh, question for this uh, talk is by dr indra malik and dr indra malik wants to know which which anotrope as you find is more use, most useful in cardiogenic shock in while doing CAVG. 
Yeah, uh, we always prefer, in our institute, we always prefer to use adrenaline as a first agent of choice. And also, if uh, second uh, choice needed, we'll go for milrinu because uh, we want, uh, it will reduce the mycologsin demand uh, by uh, increasing the contractility and producing some vasodilatation. The afterload, which is reduction is very much needed in these patients. So we always prefer to use adrenaline and the milrinone as a second choice. So uh, what doses of adrenaline? Adrenaline, we'll start with 0 0.05 mics per kg. We will attain up to 0 0.2 mics per kg. Once that uh, maximum dose of 0 0.2 mics per kg is attained and still we are not happy with the hemodynamics as well as the contractility of the heart, then we will go for the additional support of milrinone starting with 0.5 mics per kg per minute. Yeah, I, I agree with you on this. I, I love the combination of adrenaline and milrinone together. Um, but my only, uh, the only thing which I, I mean, I would prefer is to keep the low dose, the dose of adrenaline very, very low, and as low as possible because I do not take a along with it. I don't know whether Sachin agrees with me on that or. Yes, sir. I think uh, you're right. Uh, the tachycardia at times could be worrisome. Uh, and uh, we also have seen milrinone. Of course, I do not know what uh, dose Dr. Saruna Babu uses, but milrinone also at times does cause a bit of vasodilatation. And ultimately, we end up starting either vasopressin or a small dose of noradrenaline to counter that. Uh, so, uh, but the combination does work well, in uh, especially in cardiogenic shock. And uh, I think uh, it's just the uh, the doses needs to be tweaked. Otherwise, I guess this combination works fine. Great. Thank you. Uh, now, now, my questions will be directed to Dr. Naveen Bhavsar and Dr. Rajiv Janeja uh, for the talk on heart failure and uh, right heart failure. Sorry. So, this question is from Dr. Muthu Kumar Rajagopalan, and he wants to know how will you treat RV failure perioperatively and postoperatively? And do you rely on a, any particular monitor uh, when T is not available? When T is not available, uh, I think uh, PA catheter and monitoring both PA pressures and CVP is useful. And if you have a uh, have continuous cardiac output PA catheter, that will be a preferred choice. Uh, so, uh, uh, Dr. Babsar, from the question from my side, what would be your preferred uh, agent of choice for support? Uh, I think milrinone is uh, preferred. And uh, if uh, required, we can add dobutamine to that. And as I said, if uh, then hypotension is there, you can uh, start with uh, noradrenaline and uh, then later vasopressin. Vasopressin, okay. Uh, there are lots of people who uh, go in directly for vasopressin. That's why I asked you this question. Because there, I mean, there's a big uh, controversy, of course. I don't say that. I don't say that you are wrong. There's a big controversy. Lots of people just go directly for vasopressin. And um, that is their choice. Sir, as such, vasopressin, because it has advantage of uh, not affecting the PVR, uh, it is preferred. And second, as I said, it uh, augments diuresis, so decongestion will also happen. And diastolic pressure improves, so mycorrhizal uh, perfusion is also improved. So what? that could be one of the reasons of adding vasopressin earlier than other. And what about uh, nitric oxide? Uh, are you having? I don't think all hospitals have it, but in case you have a nitric oxide, yeah, because we are, sir, we are heart transplant center. We are having nitric oxide. Okay. And uh, uh, unless for elevated or heart transplant, we have never used nitric oxide in any. Okay, you haven't used. Uh, you don't use it routinely for RV failures, and okay. Uh, sometimes in congenital heart disease, we use. Uh, Dr. Rajiv, uh, uh, do you have any opinion on this? Rajiv Junaja? Yeah, actually, uh, RV dysfunction is a combination of a whole lot of things. It, it, it combines preload, the offload on the RV, and uh, the seismic pressure. Now, as far as uh, come back in your, coming back to your question about vasopressin, there are two advantages. One, it doesn't affect PVR. Second, it has a little less effect on the kidney uh, rather than high doses of norepine or norepinephrine. So uh, vasopressin would be better in that case. And what we do is, and we go on for a certain dose of norepinephrine. Uh, RV dysfunction, I think the PA is a tremendous uh, tool. And I would agree with Dr. Kalikar that uh, throughout our experience, we've been working together for a long time. The PA catheter does pick up problems much better than the CVP in op-cap surgery and also in right ventricular dysfunction. So in right ventricular dysfunction, you need to have a good systolic pressure 
you need to have the right sided colonies also filling therefore you need to have a good uh, uh, systemic pressure uh, you need to reduce the pulmonary artery uh, pressures and you have to have adequate i mean we a lot of people forget this but the filling of the right ventricle is important you can't have a underfilled uh, right ventricle just because you have a high pa pressure because the uh, uh, the uh, stroke volume will reduce because uh, the amount of blood going to the left side will reduce and therefore you will have hypotension so these are the things which are concerned i think with the right ventricular dysfunction and as far as inotropes are concerned yes uh, epinephrine non epinephrine slash vasopressin dobutamin or milrinone preferably milrinone uh, these are the inotropes that one could use Uh, thank you, Rajiv. Uh, thank you, all chairpersons and the speakers. It was a wonderful session. I enjoyed it very much. I'm sure the audience also must have enjoyed it and gained a lot from all your experiences. Thank you very much. The time constraints force me to close this session. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.